gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The show starts in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Electricity here in Columbia, what has been buzzing loudly all weekend. Passion of the crowd in Williams Bryce Stadium is second to none. And the rain breaks out in Columbia. It is good! Gamecock fans, welcome home. See how it goes, uh, but we'll be ready to go. It's time to root. Let's go, Carolina! It's gone! Touchdown! He makes it in! Can you believe it? Cops have won this game! Here are your hosts, J.C. Sherbert. Oh, watch him celebrate now! Bill Molinax. My wife doesn't like hanging around losing. And Jamie Bradford. I'm going to tell him, you look like you joined Doug Dynasty. <laughs> All right, greetings and good morning. Welcome aboard and welcome home. Inside the Gamecocks, Inside the show, the live Gamecocks, the show, from the Sinorama Studios the Sinorama and built Studios by the Barndo Co. Co. The Barndominium Co. Dot com, dot where you can build your dream you home your for as low as $160 per square foot. JC's back. JC's back. In a hotel room. In a hotel room. In the great state of, the South, great state Carolina. of South Carolina. We'll be joined today we'll by Helmer Graham and Hand. Our hour with our Mike, hour Morgan, Mike coming up Morgan coming up at, at noon. noon. Uh, plenty to get uh, to, plenty though. To get to Major League Baseball, Baseball has a couple, has a couple of, strange of strange stories. stories. One, in Baltimore, One in, Baltimore, in Baltimore, the other is in New York. In if New you York, haven't seen you haven't what Aaron Boone Aaron did Aaron to get tossed last night, it is hilarious. Plus, we've got some thoughts on the top 25. The ACC potentially trying to bring themselves in line with Cal and Stanford? What the hell does that have to do with the Atlantic Coast Conference? And much, much more. Make sure you check into the Nana Sports chat box. And if you haven't, download the all-new Chief Sports app where you can find us as part of the Chief Sports Network. That is growing, and our partners are in there as well. JC, sorry we uh, we missed you yesterday. We know you had a bit busy day in Columbia and we know you're headed back to Chicago and then back to Columbia and then back to Chicago and then back to Columbia and then God knows where from there. But uh, we um, we uh, certainly are happy to have you back with us here on a Tuesday. And we'll see what Hale's got to say, by the way, guys, meeting with the players this morning uh, as well. Uh, planes, trains, and automobiles. If you're on a train, where are you going on a train here in, here in 2023? 2023. Well, is, I wish that, I wish that, the train went back uh, from the the hotel uh, to where I'm at. Uh, I mean, uh, from where I got to fly into. Um, you guys are probably not going to hear much from me because I've got headphone issues right now, and that's what was causing the echo. So uh, I'll turn it back over to these guys. <clears throat> I think as long as I'm talking, it's fine. But uh, when they start talking, it's going to be uh, a little crazy. So so let me get on this uh, new laptop. Unexpected. Uh, I had it all set up. Obviously, yesterday was an adventure with uh, all that, but uh, let me set that up. But, yeah, flying back today and then coming back to Columbia uh, probably this weekend. That's a, It's been delayed by about a week, but I uh, had a great meeting at USC yesterday. I've had a lot of stuff and a uh, uh, good quick trip into town. I, I got caught in a wreck on I-77. Hour and a half later, I wasn't going to make the flight, and uh, it was storming anyway, so I got to change my flight for free on Southwest and uh, flying out the same time tonight. Didn't want to miss the show again. So uh, flying out about eight o'clock this evening. So. All right. Yeah. We're uh, we, the echo situation We're we're trying to get that figured out. I think we might know what's going on. So hopefully we're, we've got a beat on it here. Um, Phil, the, this, uh, I know we're a Carolina show and we've had plenty to get to in football and we're going to get to plenty of football today, a full hour with Mike and about, uh, 20 25 minutes or so with Hale coming up including the ACC stuff 
I thought that Major League Baseball yesterday, um, I thought the story was was essentially, and it is, uh, the fact that the Baltimore Orioles have suspended their their play by play guy, Kevin Wilson, I think is his name. Um, for I don't know if, he, if if anybody missed this, they suspended him for a pregame graphic in Tampa for pointing out the fact that the Orioles for I don't even know how long, since like 2015, have literally stunk in Tampa. Yeah. And he didn't say anything bad. He just gave facts and details. And but was highlighting the fact that they've played well there this year. And he got suspended for that. They pulled him off the air and suspended him. And so everybody with a pulse who's been in this business, even if they haven't been in this business and have a pulse, they've been like, what are you do? You're embarrassing yourselves. I mean, you fired John Miller at one point in time, the maybe, maybe the best guy in the business. And now you now you're gonna do yourself to the, you know. You're doing this. Okay. So that's a story. Until Aaron Boone got thrown out of the game last night in New York. And he drew a line outside of home plate against, uh, I think it's Laz Diaz, the home plate umpire, and mimicked his strike three call. Been making fun of him was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he is Aaron Boone is working his way quickly into Bobby Cox category of how many times can I get thrown out of a ball game, not only in a season, but in a career. Bobby took pride in that. And it was something he truly believed in that helped the Atlanta Braves play good baseball. And, and you know, if you ask a lot of the guys that play in that generation, they tell you it actually did at times. But Aaron Boone, that was good. That one's that's an all timer. Did you see it? What the I saw the it mimicking him. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Uh, oh, it was hilarious. I, I mean, you know, you just you know can't make that stuff up, really. <laughs> oh man, it was the funniest. And he and they bleeped out a lot of it, but the rest of it you could hear it. And he kept saying the same thing over and over. You stink. You stink. You stink. Yeah, this, stink. You stink. You stink. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well you done love Aaron baseball Boone. yeah man. well done <laughs> yeah well done that's awesome that is so so awesome the yankees should be proud of their manager man that was awesome yeah, to see that yeah, that's so that's one where it's like i usually i don't know most of the time when a manager gets you know tossed i'm, I'm always happy with it but yeah. uh, you know, because it's like uh, it's either for the team. I mean, you know, it's one of those things. It's all calculated, and and there's reasoning behind it. But yeah, that was a good one last night for sure. <laughs> Absolutely, no, no question about it. <laughs> Dude, it was awesome. And the Yankees are it would in last only place. been better if it were Angel Hernandez, though. I will throw that out there. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah, he's he's still putting around. Uh, he um, he the the Yankees are in last place, but they're actually only five and a half games out in the wild card. So if he, you know, if they can get going, they could they could squeeze everybody in the American League East. I mean, right now, look at the top: the Orioles and the Rays. If you can believe that, but the Baltimore Orioles are leading it by three three uh, three games. So it's um, it is really really incredible to see what's happening over there. And then the stories with the first place team and the last place team in that division. But nobody is better than our Atlanta Braves. So whoever wins it. Hopefully you'll see the Braves in the World Series again. That's uh, right. I'm happy my Cubbies are only two and a half games back in their uh, division, so it's like they made a little run here. Yeah, I think the um, I think one of the one of the neat things this year about Major League Baseball is how many teams are actually in it for the wild card. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's basically six in the American League and six in the National League. You could probably say seven actually in the National League. So 13 teams playing for wild card spots right now in both leagues. It's pretty good. If you are, uh, if you are a uh, a baseball fan, it is eleven thirteen on this uh, August the eighth. Uh, speaking of watching things on TV, it's out today, guys. The new Johnny Manziel documentary on Netflix. Uh, it it it's now it's out now. You could go watch it after our show, of course, at one o one p.m. Uh, or tonight as you're getting into bed. But uh, I've been looking forward to seeing this, and fr from what I understand, he. He didn't hold back. I'm assuming they probably said, hey, the, the more that you tell, the more money we'll pay. 
and we know that Johnny Manziel has long been about the dough. So that that I don't know how how long is it? An hour, hour and a half? Oh, I don't. Does anybody know? I, don't know? I haven't looked. I knew it was coming out, but I have not yet looked at how long it is. Let's yeah, see. I hear it's real raw and open. I mean, he talks about his mental health struggles after you know getting booted from the Browns, and yeah, you could just kind of see that coming. You know, it's like just the way he operated, even in college. You know, that kind of braggadocio larger than life personality he's got is just, you know, look like, look like something was bubbling underneath. Yeah. Yeah. Hour. There you go. Daryl. Thanks, Daryl. Hour and 12 minutes long. No, uh, that's not bad at all. No, no, nah, it's not. That's, that's good. Especially after I'm dealing with dogs and kids, that's a good, easy watch to go to, to go to sleep. I'll tell you too. Uh, I've been watching the last couple of nights. If you haven't heard of this, it is unfortunately, Unfortunately, it's really good, um, if that makes sense. There's a show on Netflix called Missing, Dead or Alive, and it is a four-episode d- documentary series uh, from the Richland County Sheriff's Department about uh, missing persons cases that they have been working on up there. And um, it so it's it's all over the streets of Columbia, so it really you you'll recognize if you know Columbia or live in Columbia, been there, whatever, you'll actually recognize a lot of the places that they are. And um it's a it's a it's a neat look behind the scenes at their investigative work and very well done. So if you're gonna check that, if you're looking for something else to check out here, is we're just still a couple of weeks away from kicking off college football. Uh, and, uh, that'll, that'll, that'll buy you some time. If, uh, if you're looking for something, we got high school football kicking off on Friday nights too. And we do have NFL preseason coming up this week. So that's all fine and dandy as well. Uh, again, Hale McGranahan is coming up and so is Mike Morgan, the power hour presented by Palmetto Medicare. All right, Phil, I could, couldn't believe my ears yesterday when they first said this, but I, according to Pete Thamel, there is some truth into it in the fact that the ACC is beginning to discuss adding, potentially, Cal and Stanford. What on God's green earth is going on here? Um, <laughs> Grasping I, at straws, trying to maintain relevance. You know, <laughs> what are you... Like Cal and Stanford, you know? What are I you just, doing? Yeah, what are you doing? Oceanic Athletic Conference. <laughs> yeah, I, I see. Get ready. It's coming. <laughs> yeah, what according to Pete Thamel's reporting, one source said it's complicated. There's a significant travel expense. Well, duh. I think <laughs> it's going say. to be all over the board with both the ADs and the presidents and what they may want to do. Uh, Cal and Stanford would likely have to take a reduced share. Eventually, though, they're going to want to become a Full share, but I mean, why? Like, what if if you're the ACC? What are you getting out of this? I don't see the benefit in, in it at all from an ACC perspective, other than you're continuing to grow the number of teams in your conference. I guess if if the if the view of the ACC is to we have to maintain the size of everyone else, then I guess I get it, but. I don't know. It just seems like it's it's nothing more than, you know, throwing the two West Coast schools a bone here because it's, you know, it's not anything they have to do. And I and I, I, don't, I don't really think it benefits them at all. I mean, if I was them, yeah, I, I look, if I was them, I wouldn't do it. No. I mean, if I, well, if you're the PAC, if you, PAC, excuse me, if you're at Cal and Stanford, I, I literally see zero, zil, none, no benefit to this at all. It, it does nothing to, you're better off regionalizing yourselves just like the ACC would be better off if they really want to expand regionalizing themselves with a couple of extra teams. We have you fixed now, JC. Yeah. Is this better for everybody? Yeah. Much better. Much better. better. Yeah. Yeah, All right. So I got new headphones and and they're like not fancy They're I mean, they're, they're actually noise canceling and so I was going to wear those and it's supposed to plug right into the computer, like old school style. Uh uh-uh, uh, wasn't working right, so I had to get my old headphones. Uh, I hope, luckily, I brought them, and I pray they don't run out of batteries. Um, and uh, 
and had, had to go the Bluetooth route. So I'm like, when in the hell has it ever been that like you can't just plug something in uh, and it worked? You got to go the Bluetooth route. But um, anyway, yeah, look, the ACC is totally desperate. I, I think Sean mentions that the, the, the education connection, that's a that's just a huge crock of crap. Yeah. And that's why the Pac-12 yeah. went away. I agree. Because and no disrespect the, the to huge... you, Sean. I, I know what you're saying. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I oh, get no, no, yeah. no, no, no. I'm not yeah, this, yeah. I'm not. No, it's a that, it's a huge you're, Sean's absolutely coming from, right. He's dead on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. coming from them. The, the huge the huge crop you know, crock of crap comes from the <laughs> ACC and, and the Pac-12. They're they're hubris um is what led to their demise. And 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 it it, it, it it's kind of hard for people to swallow. Because people have a big BS meter. And, you know, people want to villainize the SEC because a lot of people outside the South don't like the South and they're jealous and all that. And um, and they're jealous because we win in the South. But I'll tell you this, it, the, the conference that should be vilified is, is the Big Ten because they're the ones that have been sitting there preaching academics all these years. They're the ones that started that deal with over-signing, accusing the SEC schools of cheating every right and left. Uh, the athletic right from Ohio State comes out and talks about pay for play. And, and trust me, you don't want to go. South Carolina did it successfully with Dylan Stewart, but most schools don't want to go up against them on the recruiting trail because of the NIL resources they have. Uh, it's a it's a massive, you know, layer. It's a it's a it's like a lasagna of hypocrisy. There's so many layers to that conference, and the ACC and Pac-12 were just right there with them. All pissed off because oh Texas and Oklahoma left with the SEC. I'm so jealous. Oh my god. Well, maybe you shouldn't make bad deals for your conference like the ACC did. Maybe you shouldn't have had all the hubris and arrogance when you expanded to begin with. If you want to build a football league, why are you sitting there refusing to take Virginia Tech in the mid 2000s? Because you want to take Syracuse because they align with their academics. Oh my God, darn. <laughs> Ended up getting Syracuse anyway. They took an act of Congress, the state of Virginia's Congress, to get them to take Virginia Tech. They never took West Virginia, causing them. Now who's the outpost now? Causing those right. guys to have to go join the Big 12 because they. And then you turn around and, and add Louisville when you, you panic and add Louisville when you lose Maryland. It's a big commuter school, right? I don't know that Louisville uh, has, you know, the academic rankings of the other schools. So, so now, you know, and this is this is the function of school presidents, people that don't know crap about sports, making decisions for sports. Uh, so, so now you're going to take Stanford and Cal, and not, I mean, I, if they took all four, you know, just to kind of save those schools. I could maybe see it, but uh, no. the bi-coastal conference or whatever, maybe, maybe maybe you add six. Maybe you add San Diego State along with that, and you have a, a bi-coastal conference. But to me, you know, going down this path with Stanford and Cal just because of their academics or whatever, it, it, it makes me want to throw up. This is why the Pac-12 doesn't exist anymore. And when, it, when, it, when push comes to shove, guys, the academic, these bow tie guys, Call them the bow tie guys. These bow tie guys, they don't give a flip about anything but money and hearing themselves talk in the media. You know, nobody goes to the, the Arizona State president, who is a moron who should go because of mishandling athletics. When you look into his career as an academic, he's actually done quite well for ASU, which before he got there was known as nothing but a party school. You could get in by signing your birth certificate, you know, uh, and now it's an AAU member. Because he did so, he did some innovative online. I mean, he's really good at his job outside of athletics, right? But wh wh where does he get all his publicity from? When do the cameras come? They don't come say, "Oh man, we got to go interview Michael Crow because he has this awesome online ed thing that with one hundred forty thousand students, he's the man." You know, and maybe that's a societal thing, but that's the truth. And these presidents love the camera. Keep in mind, they're all politicians. So they're part of a gigantic academic bureaucracy. So uh, I, I, it makes me, honestly, of all the solutions for the ACC, this is the worst. This is not going to bring more dollars to the table, TV-wise. It's not going to fix the grant of rights. And it's just going to make, you know, schools from primarily from the south and the northeast head to the Bay Area multiple times during a season.
Yeah, which is not and, – and Eli Drinkwitz, I know a lot of people don't care for him. He he nailed it the other day. And, you know, hey, look, we're all talking about football. Everybody has this conversation out of context. You ever notice that? Everybody mm-hmm. only thinks that there's one sport on the planet, and that's football when they have these conversations. Now, I know that the football money is what drives it. I get that. But there are all these other – you're going to have a – this is coming. I hope everybody realizes this. You're going to have a problem down the road. And that problem is going to be, regardless of television money, the fact that somebody's going to start looking at books somewhere and saying, hey, you know what? Really don't like the fact that we're sending the women's tennis team across the country 15 times over the next three months. That's costing us a million dollars to do it. And I don't want to do this anymore. You know, So what are we going to do about it? And I don't know what the answer is going to be. I'll tell you what I would do if I was the ACC. And I know that some people will, again, instantly hear this and they'll think about the success of the athletic programs at these institutions. And they'll say, well, that doesn't fit. I get it. But if you're the ACC, you want to save yourself some face. You want to to build your TV deal up a little bit. You want to create some feel good. Add Army and Navy. How about that? Add Army and Navy. Army is an independent. They'd probably like to have that money at the military academy up there, wouldn't they? Navy yeah. is in the American Athletic Conference. I bet they'd like a couple extra bucks in their pocket. We all know that every the tax dollars fund all this stuff for these dudes. Add Army and Navy. So what? They come in and get their rear ends kicked for a couple of years. They'll figure it out. They've already loosened the transfer portal stuff for those guys. If you're the ACC, do something different. Don't fall in line. Don't just try to fit uh, in. Do something different. I don't fits the footprint too with those two schools. I mean, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. New York mm-hmm. and Maryland. I don't necessarily think Army and Navy would go come in and get their butt kicked in football. Probably other sports, yeah. Basketball. Could you imagine Duke playing at West Point? Well, I can tell well, look, you this. I, 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 We've I all seen Virginia it. Tech. Was, I thought Virginia Tech was going to get killed going to the ACC basketball. They were. I was wrong. You know so. Yeah, I mean it's this this whole thing that the ACC a, the ACC that I that's just a des it, it looks desperate probably is desperate and you know and I and I honestly I feel bad for the Pac schools I do um, you know the Pac twelve is I've enjoyed the Pac twelve over the years. I mean, I really have. I mean, it's it's a it's a been a fun league in football. It's an excellent baseball league and softball league. It's had its moments in hoops, uh, and it's won a ton of. I mean, the most national championships of any league ever in all the Olympic sports, which is amazing. I think one of the things that keep, continues to get misquoted, guys, is uh, I, I can't believe this. I've enjoyed watching the Pac twelve late at night. Now that's going away. No, no, no. They're not moving the actual campuses. They're just changing yeah. leagues. Like, they're still going to have to play at 10 o'clock yeah. at night on the East Coast. So, don't <laughs> worry. You'll still get to watch them. It'll just be the Big Ten. Man, imagine you, you mentioned a women's tennis team and the, the Olympic sports, Jamie. If you're, if you're playing an Olympic sport at an ACC school, not only is that a haul. In Olympic sports, Cal and Stanford are really, really – Really, really, really freaking good. Keep yeah. in mind, Tiger Woods played golf there. So, and anyway, yeah, uh, it's uh, it is amazing uh, where we are. Uh, is my mic time. messed up? This is great. Super. I I'll try to see if I can do something. Like yeah, it's, it's kind of acting up. Yeah, it's kind of falling. Apart I don't know if it's trying to four. tap into your mic from the head. Get that? I don't know. <laughs> We'll try to see what we can do uh, during the break. We do need to hit a quick timeout, though. Uh, When we return, uh, we'll be joined by Hale McGranahan with TheBigSpur.com. He did meet with the players this morning as practice is not only underway, it is hotter than you know what outside here in the great state of South Carolina. We are powered by Electric Bikes of Charleston. Inside the Gamecocks, the show, part of the Chief Sports Network. We'll be right back. Welcome home. That's what the Gamecocks say, and so does the Barn Doe Company, where they can build your dream home starting as low as $160 per square foot. If you live in the Carolinas, Georgia, or Tennessee, their turnkey process takes just four to six months on average and can be custom designed by size and details. Make your dream a reality. 
visit thebarndominiumco.com. That's thebarndominiumco.com. The Barn Doe Company. Gamecock owned and operated. Welcome to TravelingCountryClub.com, your modern golf club experience. Hey folks, this is Michael Manis, former Gamecock golfer, inviting you to play more golf with a membership to TravelingCountryClub.com. With over 40 courses across the Carolinas, our membership provides you with an affordable way to enjoy a club-like golf experience. From the mountains to the coast, we offer golf courses that will challenge all types of golfers, no matter your handicap level or level of play. Plus, we offer unique membership benefits not seen anywhere else as part of Traveling Country Club. Tee it up with Traveling Country Club, TravelingCountryClub.com, TravelingCountryClub.com, proud partners of Inside the Gamecocks, the show. Hey everybody, this is Mo Copper from Carolina Football. The show is painted garden and black every day by a couple of painters. Go to LetMePaintSomething.com to check them out. Go Cox. 10% off for military repeat customers or mention the show. Interior, exterior painting, fencing, cabinet staining, concrete painting, popcorn ceiling removal, and more. 803-522-6832. LetMePaintSomething.com. <laughs> Hail headbanging? Oh, he's not headbanging. Must be. Well, you're no, like a uh-huh. fish guy, right? I, I like all kinds of stuff, but uh, but yeah, I am a fish guy to answer your question. You are I'll so I'll, I'll I'll flow with some rap. I'll uh uh-huh. I'll, it. I'll I'll do I'll do a little bit of everything. What what is your favorite kind of fish? You like to eat redfish or flounder or <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, oh, were, were we talking about something different? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, I, I do like seafood, though. Big seafood guy. <laughs> it's awesome. No, I'm just messing with you. I know. You're not, I know. You're not one of the guys that gets out there in the tie dye and like, you know, like 70s. You don't do that, do you? No. Okay. All right, just checking. No. Uh, if anybody is looking for uh, Schubert, he's once again trying to figure out what on planet Earth is going on with his technology as he travels between uh, the Palmetto State and headed back to Chicago. Then he'll be back here in just a couple of days and all that stuff. So poor guys run down and apparently so is the computer. So they're trying to uh, trying to get it worked out. All right. Um, Hale McGranahan with the big spur.com. Luckily, Hale, well, luckily and unluckily, it's August for football. It's also August for heat and humidity, which has kind of sucked over the last few days and the faster that gets out of here, the better off that we will all be. Uh, one of the things that Vershawn Lee talked about this morning was playing center and the fact that he had only done that in high or had not done that in high school, has only done that in college. He is being cross-trained as pretty much, I think, all offensive linemen are right now at Carolina up front. But um, reports are that Vershawn Lee is kind of taking the bull by the horns. What have you learned about his leadership up there? Yeah, I, I think probably – that's that's a big reason why they they feel good about him at center and why he's gotten that look and sort of stuck is 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 that leadership quality that's a big part of the position and, and being able to 
you know, be front and center, pun intended, I guess. Uh, that's that's part of the deal. Like they touch the ball every play and make a lot of the calls. And, and it really starts, you know, the old cliche of it all starts up front. Well, it all starts up front with the guy who's, who's snapping the ball. So uh, I think it's, it's been a, a great fit so far. And, you know, back in January when Nick Arjula was coming in, I think maybe some of the assumption, at least on, on my end, was that he would just immediately be the guy. And, and uh, for, for whatever reason, Vershawn Lee has ended up being more of the fit there. Uh, Gargiulo's, you know, going back to what you were saying about cross-training, JB's, Gargiulo's cross-training at center. I, I would imagine that uh, if, if Rashawn Lee is, for whatever reason, has to come out of a game, that Nick Gargiulo would probably be the, the number two center, regardless of, you know, what a depth chart might say or what we, what we might see, uh, we the media, when, when we go out to practice and, and see the first-team offense and the second-team offense and all that. Um, but, yeah, I, I think Rashawn Lee has been – Maybe a little bit of a pleasant surprise that way, uh, because he, you know, has zero experience or had zero experience coming into uh, into this this calendar year at that position. Yeah, the Gargiulo thing is interesting. Like yeah, well, I was throwing Gargiulo what to guard? Is that what the thought is? Yeah, left. He's he's been at left guard, I think, pretty much exclusively with the first group. I, I, I'm guessing he's probably jumped in at center some. Uh, during the spring and maybe even some this month. I don't know for sure, but, uh, yeah, I, I think right now that that's your center and left guard is Roshan Lee and Gargiulo being, being the left guard. Yeah, I think there's going to continue to be more and more conversation about the offensive line because, you know, we, it's expected that Spencer Rattler is going to be okay. We'll get to the running backs here in just a second, Hale, and, and we're very aware of the talent they have at the wideout positions, including tight end. But um, as Dow Loggins spoke a couple of weeks ago, this is all really going to go as the guys up front go. Um, but so with the interior, you mentioned Gargiulo. He's a big man. Uh, you mentioned Vershawn Lee. Trey Jones uh, at, at right guard. This would be his first full year as a starter if he earns it. And, and as of now, it appears that he probably has. Uh, when you look at the interior there, how would you, how would you summarize – that group we'll get to the tackles in a minute but just the interior is that is that something that we feel like the coaching staff is starting to really kind of wrap their their minds around feeling pretty good about i would think so um for for those first two guys that we just talked about i, I think that's where it starts and over at right guard you know trey jones ha has some experience and, and he's been pretty solid marquee anderson is is one of the guys who's the backup at, at right guard and someone who I think the staff would probably ultimately hopes can, can emerge and, and eventually take that spot over uh, whether it's before the end of this month or before the end of the season. I, I think that's kind of what, you know, if, if things go as, as they hope that that's what would eventually happen. Um, but if, if Trey Jones is still the guy, then Trey Jones is still the guy. Um, but yeah, I, I would, I think relative to, where they are at tackle, I, I think it, it's probably safe to say that uh, things are a little bit stronger inside than they are on the outside at this point. So then what's going on at tackle? What are you hearing out there? Well, Ja'Kai Moore has, has been out there as the left tackle. We saw Sidney Fugar at, at, at right tackle on, on Friday, the first day. Um, and Tyshawn Wanamaker was back over there at right tackle uh, yesterday on Monday. And, you know, he was he was obviously the guy there for much of the spring and, and uh, you know, Jalen Nichols obviously being, you know, unhealthy and not, not playing. That's, that's a pretty significant loss. So what, you know, we'll just kind of have to see how, how things go with those guys. I mean, Ja'Kai Moore's played a lot, played mm -hmm. some at guard as well throughout the course of his career, but you know, he's somewhat dependable and uh, may, may not necessarily be the most ideal fit there because, you know, he, obviously wasn't the starter there in the spring. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just have to kind of see how that goes. And uh, as I've said before, I, I think folks are just going to have to kind of hang on and grin and bear it and, and hope hope that uh, they can give Rattler enough time to show off that big arm, throw the ball downfield and, and uh, open up some holes for, for Joyner and the running backs. 
at the running back position is to carry on Joiner, and we did talk to Whittle about this a little bit yesterday. It, they're really not making it much of a secret up there right now. To carry on Joiner is RB one. Uh, maybe I'd say you hail about a week ago. You could say that it was. I wouldn't call. I don't know if I'd, you'd say close, but you know it was. Uh, it's been a competitive group. Where are we a week later? My understanding is he's beginning to separate himself. Yeah, I think he really started to separate himself before the spring was over. Um, that they, they like the fit, and you know, as I've kind of patted myself on the back since we heard about this thing earlier this year, I, you know, no duh, like, I always thought that that was a uh, a good fit for carry on Joiner if he wasn't playing quarterback, and and uh, I, I'm really excited to see how it actually looks, you know, when when they're playing. And we're not just out there seeing them, you know, run through a line with guys wearing just shoulder pads and, and not really tackling. And it's not even a real game, obviously. So I, I'm just ready to see what it looks like for real. I mean, we, we've heard nothing but great things. Um, and he certainly looks apart just as, as a guy who is playing running back. You know, you know certain players, you know, look the part of a position and, and he, he more than <laughs> – fits that criteria like that that's that's part of the excitement i guess is that, that it just it looks like it's supposed to when when he's playing running back uh whether or not it plays out that way we'll see but i i'm i'm pretty excited and, and i know the folks over there at that building are are real fired up about it too and as long as he can keep getting some reps this this month and and get more acclimated to the position i i think it's going to end up looking pretty solid, uh, assuming assuming the offensive line can uh, can keep it together. Hail McGranahan, the Big Spur, eleven forty one here on this uh, Tuesday, August the eighth. All right, so what happened yesterday? A little scuffle out there. Yeah, well, I, I think Lonnie Teasley was kind of standing up for for one of his uh, or for his offensive guys. There was, I guess, a little extracurricular shove when when Bradley Dunn was uh, going through a team team period. And I, I think Brian Thomas Jr. may have been given a little extra business, uh, helped him down to the ground a little bit. And uh, there was, you know, some back and forth between the players. And, you know, Sterling, Sterling Lucas was involved and, and Lonnie Teasley took exception to it and, and was uh, hollering back and forth with him for a few seconds. Uh, you know, beyond that, I, I don't really know, <laughs> know what was said or – what exactly got one guy uh, mad or, or what? But um, you know, it's football. It's it. I don't. I don't think there's anything to worry about. People were kind of wondering on the Big Spur message board about you know should, should there be some concern about the coaches uh, being restrained and yelling at each other? Um, you know, it, again, it's it's football practice. It was hot as hell out there. It was 95 and it felt like 111 according to my. Weather app on my phone. Uh, so I, I think uh, I think it was pretty easy to get a little testy out there uh, if somebody you know even in the slightest kind of pissed you off. Like uh, so again, <laughs> it's football. Like it's it's an emotional game. People get get mad from time to time and and move on. Let's see. When does Shane meet with the media next week? Saturday. Saturday, Saturday after the scrimmage. Okay, their first scrimmage comes yeah. up Saturday. Uh, Hale, it is now on your shoulders to ask Shane who he thinks would win in a fight between Lonnie Teasley and Sterling Lucas. All yeah. right. All well, right. I mean, he, they, he was already asked. Somebody already asked him, you know, who he wanted to fight, what other head coach in the SEC. Why not ask him about his own guys? Who, who would win? A little fair. battle royale. Yeah, it's fair. Yeah. I, I tell you what, I'll go Sterling Lucas because – Travian Robertson uh, is on his side of the ball with him, and <laughs> and Travian Travian's in pretty decent shape still, and and uh, yeah, and he's Travian Robertson, so I wouldn't want to uh, poke that bear. Yeah, I don't mean any disrespect to the offensive coaches, uh, but I would go with the defensive guys. If if a scrum a scrum broke out, offense defense, I think mm -hmm. the defensive guys would. I think it would it would end pretty quickly, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to say Travian Robertson's on one side, and I'll take that side. <laughs> Where's Limbo and all this? Limbo's like, I'll let, I'm going to let all these idiots fight it out. I'm so <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we can let Pete Limbo do the, uh, the color commentary. Like he'll be the Joe Rogan of the, uh, <laughs> yeah. of the whole deal. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Actually, where's Luke day. And day, he's probably the referee. He, he's going yeah. to, yeah. Herb Dean. Right. Luke day's yeah. Herb Dean. Which, by the way, um, this is not something that's been discussed much at all with the coaching staff, but Jamil Walker being a part of the strength staff is a really big deal. I mean, he was in charge of it at Arkansas. And as a matter of fact, I think him and Shane had had previous conversations about joining the staff before Luke Day was hired at South Carolina. Nonetheless, for whatever reason, they decided to go in a different direction last year, and he's here now as part of Luke's staff. That's it. No one's really discussed that much, but it's a big deal. Yeah, I, I, I would think so. I mean, if you've been a head strength coach at an SEC school, uh, that's that's a nice little line on your resume, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> nice, nice uh, low key addition to your point, JB. Low key addition to the staff. That you know, and I don't pretend to know a whole lot about lifting weights and stuff, um, but yeah, I, I would think that. Uh, it's a nice, nice little move there. I don't. I mean, I, I, I get my my little old man workout in, and that's that. I, that's not a whole lot. I'm not going to pretend to know anything about lifting weights, but you know, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, um, check out uh, what these am, gains, bro. Yeah, dude. Yeah, check it out. On the Should defense, I take my shirt off. You want me to take my shirt off? Well, it's up to you. Whatever you want to oh, do. Oh, please. Uh, Hold yeah. on. Let me tweet that first. This is this is your <laughs> segment. We're just you know. Um, on the defensive side of the football hail up front, what are we learning there? I, I think that they're beginning to settle in on a couple of starters at defensive tackle. Have you have you what have you seen out there? Yeah, my my interpretation of it is is three guys are are kind of the starters. And, and you know, yeah. you're gonna start two, obviously, but of the three, Tonka Hemingway, I, I'm pretty sure he's going to be a starter in every game then it'll kind of be battled out between tj sanders and alex huntley uh then others will rotate in uh with them and behind them but i i think those are kind of the top three um safe to say and, and as we know hunt, hunt or uh tonka hemingway can can slide outside and play in so maybe depending on who they're playing and you know all those other variables that, that determine how you put what players on the field in which positions, uh, maybe, maybe Hemingway's on the outside and, and those two guys are inside, what have you. But uh, I, I think they're sort of the top three with, you know, a handful handful of guys behind them. Like, you know, Elijah Davis has, has been in the mix. Jamal Weiss mm -hmm. uh, as well, somebody we've seen on the field when, when they're lining up or running out their first, second, and third team defenses. Those are some of the guys who, who are in, in that conversation as well. And, and I look at it as like, yeah, again, two starters, you know, probably three, quote unquote. Uh, but but it's a five man type of rotation, maybe six. Uh, so you know, obviously, there's going to be more than just two guys who are playing at that position. When you when you stretch it out a little bit, though, Hale, um, it, it, I tell you what, I'll hold I'll hold this name until after this question. Uh, how about Jordan Strawn? I, I know that okay. yesterday, I think it was in your notes that he was technically in drills on the first team defense. That's not shocking when he's healthy, but we understand that he's been working to get healthy. So do you have any type of updates on, on where he may be in, in that progress? I'm sure Shane will have much more of one coming up on Saturday. Yeah, I don't I don't know what his workload has been like so far. I, I would imagine that he's not on the field for every first team rep and going through every drill, maybe not even practicing every day at this point. It's only four days in, so I, I, I don't know if they've – uh, giving him like a day off or, you know, relaxing some of his, his workload during practice. I, I would think they are but just based on what Clayton White was saying at, at the birdies with Beamer thing. He was like, you know, we'd, we'd be really dumb as coaches if we were just expecting Jordan Strawn and, and Mo Caba to to come out and, and just throw them right back into the fire like like they're ready to go. Like even, even if they look good and are playing good and seem to be responding to things, just – it's not very responsible to uh, to just ask those guys to to be back fully immersed, uh, especially since there's what three and a half weeks before a game is even played. So uh, mm -hmm. they know what they got in in Strawn and I guess Kaba too, but uh, Strawn specifically, they know what they got. They they know they need him. 
Uh, probably a lot more than they need in Mokaba at this point, just given where they're at at, at the defensive end position from, from a personnel standpoint. Uh, but it is encouraging to see him out there and moving around like he is. He looks good. Uh, he seems to be moving pretty well, too. So so I think uh, it, it certainly looks like he's heading in the right direction strong and, and will be a welcome addition when, when they line it up against the Tar Heels. Well, in a, and additionally, too, at the defensive end position, there's a feel-good story kind of starting to build itself. And this is a young man – well, he probably doesn't feel that young anymore, but he's still young to all of us who Carolina fans hopefully will get a chance to know well and really be proud of. Tyreek Johnson is a sixth-year defensive end. He's 6'3", 270 pounds. And my intel, Hale, has told me he has had a nice fall camp. His background – by the way, first starts with a bunch of injuries. He's been on campus since 2018, uh, recruited by Coach Muschamp and that staff. He's out of Sumter, South Carolina, played at Lakewood. But he's had a bunch of injuries in his career, including an ACL injury. He's also, though, been named SEC Academic Honor Roll five times, and he has also won the President's Outstanding Student Athlete Award at Carolina. He is very well liked in this program, and they're all pulling for him. So he's just a name I've heard keep an eye on. Have you seen him moving around out there? And would he add some surprising depth to that defensive end position that not long ago seemed like it might be maybe a weaker point of the football team? Yeah, he's he's had a, a blue jersey on during practice, and that's some sort of you know injury related thing. I don't, I don't know exactly what what it's supposed to represent, but. Um, He's been he's been on the field and, and practicing was with the team when they were doing their eleven on eleven stuff yesterday and yeah I mean he you, you said it was he's been on the the team since two thousand eighteen well he's supposed to be on the team starting in two thousand seventeen but he had the shoulder injury the senior year in high school when they they gray shirted him and delayed his enrollment so he didn't burn a year of eligibility um, mm -hmm. I mean this guy's been fighting through injury since before he even got to Carolina. And, and credit to him for for sticking it out. And you know when when he's played, and it hadn't been a ton. When he's played, he's he's been pretty serviceable. Like he hadn't been bad. It's just a matter of getting him there. And, and if he can stay healthy and, and maintain, like that that would be, like you said, JV, just just an awesome story, man. Like I think people lose sight of of what these guys go through from a physical standpoint, especially when they start accumulating injuries. And, and and what that does to them and so far is like do i really want to keep doing this like this sucks it, it, you know I, i'm hurt all the time i'm barely playing i still got to go through all the the bs that it takes to to play football but i'm not even playing and on top of that i don't feel great so credit to him for for toughing it out and still being here and and like you said like he, he's had a good off season and you know if he can just stay on the field I, I think he'll be a, a nice little boost to this this defensive end position which you know has its weaknesses but it, it would help if a guy like him can can come in and, and make plays and give you some good snaps by the way it's probably not a bad sign that Jatias gear i know he's a good player but he didn't just walk right in and secure a, a position a starting position it, it's been a battle for him uh maybe that uh maybe that's a little bit of insight as to some of the guys that are playing out there right now, including Brian Thomas, uh, maybe having a little bit better camp than, than some may have thought. We'll end on this one. It's a uh, listener question here. Um, I know that there's some of this stuff floating around out there, but I'll let you kind of clarify. Joe asks, I heard Tony Morrell from the Big Spur on the Mickey Plyler show this morning, which would be in the upstate, saying that Luke Doty was going to play receiver. Is this true or did someone make that up? I didn't hear the segment. Uh, it was not made up. <laughs> he uh, he's gotten gotten some looks there, and he's still playing quarterback. But uh, yeah, Luke's Luke's going to have a role. I think that that's beyond just standing on the sideline and and you know signaling in plays and and uh, you know giving giving Spencer some some pointers of what he's saying. Like I, I think he's going to Luke Luke Doty's going to be contributing in in some way, shape, or form on this football team. Uh, how exactly that comes together, what it looks like, we shall see. But, uh, yeah, I, I think he's going to be doing some stuff that beyond 
playing quarterback or being a backup quarterback. Luke Doty and on Joyner over the last five years. He's a quarterback. Now he's a receiver. Now he's a quarterback. Now he's a receiver. No, he's a running back. No, he's a quarterback. He's a receiver. Yeah. Uh, special, you know, team, special teams, uh, core special teams guy. Like yeah. we saw Doty playing special teams in the bowl game. Uh, I, I would think they're going to have to taper back some of Dick Carrion Joyner special teams duties uh, given what he means to that running back position. So uh, maybe maybe Luke Doty's an answer there that way. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. Both of these guys, uh, you know, I remember when they moved, moved Luke to wide receiver the first time and everybody said, what are you doing? And now they might leave him back to wide receiver and everybody's excited about it. So. We'll see, well, but he is—he is still a quarterback. He is a right now. He's a second-string quarterback in South Carolina. Yes, yes, and you know when when Doty made that move previously, there wasn't Spencer Rattler on campus. Lenore Sellers was like a freshman at South Florence, probably better <laughs> soccer player than a quarterback at that point in his career. Lenore Sellers wasn't born yet. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, that's Ty, you're mixing up Tyree started Tyree Johnson's career. Oh. Doty. That good guy. point. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, Hale. We'll let you run on that note. Um, I'm not gonna make the mistake that I made yesterday with Whittle and uh and ask you uh what you will be writing about this week because his response I think was football. So duh. So mm. we'll just check the big spur for football over the next few days, right? Uh yeah. Okay. Yep. All right, that sounds good. Pretty clear, huh, Phil? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the season. Yeah, that's right. Hey, I'll have a wonderful week, brother. See you uh, next week. Thank Appreciate you. It. There you go. Thanks, Hale McGranahan, uh, the, uh, the great fish master. Holy hail. McGranahan. Fish Owen. aficionado. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, well done. Yeah. I all right, we have got to run when we return. Mike Morgan, Power Hour, brought to you by Palmetto Medicare, the Golden Tones of ESPN and the SEC Network, and JC and Morgan and Westwood One and pretty much everything in between will spend the final hour with us. We know everybody enjoys this. We do, too, and we've got plenty to get into with him, including the new newly released Coaches Top 25 Georgia, how about the dogs? Is all this off-season stuff, there is some re news that just broke today pertaining to what happened in January. Will that affect them? And we'll talk some Gamecock football as well with Mike. Right here on Inside the Gamecocks, the show built by the Barndo Co., part of the Chief Sports Network. Hey, everybody. This is Mo Coppa from Carolina Football. The show is painted garden and black every day by a couple of painters. Go to LetMePaintSomething.com to check them out. Go Cox. 10% off for military repeat customers or mention the show. Interior, exterior painting, fencing, cabinet staining, concrete painting, popcorn ceiling removal, and more. 803-522-6832. LetMePaintSomething.com. If you're in the upstate of South Carolina and are in need of residential real estate services, Cindy Bass Searfoss of Caldwell Banker Kane is for you. Ask her about the village at Creekside, all of her listings in my hometown of Spartanburg, South Carolina, right there on Daniel Morgan Avenue, married to a lifelong Gamecock fan. And many of our listeners have already bought homes from her and been 100% satisfied with the detail and care she uses. Cindy Searfoss, 864 414-5271, Caldwell Banker Kane in the upstate for your real estate needs. Building your dream home is often just that, a dream and sometimes a nightmare. But at the Barndo Company, they commit to quality and build without sacrifice. Customization, open floor plans, limitless flooring options, maintenance-free and easy insulation perks, and affordability are just a few reasons why they've been named one of the best builders in the U.S. Believe in your dreams. Visit thebarndominiumco.com. That's thebarndominiumco.com. The Barndo Company. Gamecock owned. Gamecock operated. 
The preferred sign partner of Gamecock Athletics is Signorama Columbia, and they should be yours too. A full-service sign company that handles design, production, install, and service, Signorama Columbia has helped to bring to life the perfect vision for so many all across South Carolina. Owned and operated by proud Gamecock alumni, they can handle all types of signage, including interior and exterior, vehicle graphics, and more. Go to Signorama.com and find the West Columbia location or call them at 803-407-9284. Bring your brand to life with Signorama Columbia and go Gamecocks. Just as your State Farm agent combines good neighbor service with surprisingly great rates, you can combine your home, auto, life, or small business insurance with Tony Pope's State Farm Insurance today. And guess what you'll get? That's right, even more good neighbor service with surprisingly great rates. In fact, Tony Pope State Farm is your go-to agent anywhere in South Carolina, North Carolina, or Georgia for the service you deserve at the price you want. So try combining your home, life, auto, and or small business insurance today. Tony Pope State Farm has been in business for more than 30 years and can handle anything you need in the tri-state area. Once again, Tony Pope State Farm will help you mix and match perfectly. Call 843-851-2222 or visit TonyPope.com today. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Nana's Porch, nanasporch.com. At Nana's Porch, they cater weddings, parties, and all kinds of special events. Their meals are served buffet style in seconds. They're encouraged. Plus, they can bring their mobile food unit to bring on site and serve your guests as a unique alternative for your catering needs. Inquire about rentals as well. Nana'sporch.com. Find them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 336-259-7550. If you're on Medicare currently or approaching eligibility, it's time to enroll in the Medicare plan that meets your needs. Palmetto Medicare is here to help you through the process. Palmetto Medicare's owner, Brian Spencer, and his team of experts are here to assist you. Learn about the benefits and enroll in the plan that will cover as many of your medical costs as possible. Some of the advantages of Medicare health plans may include variety of plan choices, increased benefits, lower premiums, and more. Give Palmetto Medicare a call to discuss your insurance and help get the exact coverage for your needs today. Settles in the pocket, launches one deep down the field, wide open at the 15, 10, 5, touchdown, touchdown Tampa Bay. It's time for Power Hour with Mike Morgan on Inside the Gamecocks, the show. Looking deep downfield, rolling out, throws it up in the air, and it is caught, touchdown, Troy Williamson, what a catch. Saturday evening here in bluegrass country. Ahead to Buckman, oh. slam, city for Ronaldo Buckman, at the 20. 10-5, touchdown. And to Frederick, Frederick, lays it in at the buzzer. That's a win. Unbelievable. I don't believe it. Who started with one, pull up three, good if it goes. He got it. He got it. He got it. Carolina wins. Havens gets it high and deep to right. We'll see you at Hoover. Guy's pretty good at what he does. Hey, you know, decent. Got a good voice. Sounds like he's been right. doing it a while. Consummate professional. I, I, you could tell he's been doing it a while. If you go back to the call in that Kentucky South Carolina game in uh, 2004, that's a different sounding Mike Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> a younger Mike Morgan. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, it's always every time I, you put together one of those things, it's like a. Uh, what was that old game show? It was really before all of our times, but I think it was called This Is Your Life. And, oh. and, and they, would, <laughs> they would come on and um, uh, they would surprise the, the guest with like, this is the girl you dated in high school. She just happens to be here. Uh, and, and it just like all, all those type of historical things that would kind of surprise you. And every time you do one of those, it, you always outdo yourself. And it does surprise me and, uh, and takes me back to uh, so many, uh, so many good memories, really. It's, you know, it's one of those where 
you do this and I've been doing it my whole life. And, um, you, you, you it, there's so much onto the next one, onto the next one that you don't have time to really look back and kind of take it in, in, in volume. But when you hear something like that, yeah, it's, it's very cool. Well, those were a lot of that was, especially the Carolina stuff is pretty cool moments for, uh, for Carolina fans, but I know you've also had quite an honor over the last couple of years calling a bunch of NFL games, getting to call Tom Brady. Uh, now that he's retired, I guess he's going to stay yeah. retired. Who knows? Maybe he'll come back again. I, th uh, I think he's done. I think, that he's done. Was, uh, I think in that game, it was he threw four touchdowns and I was counting them out like, there's number 602, there's number 603, <laughs> because I know I'll look back at that and be like, holy smokes, I called some Tom Brady touchdown passes toward the end, and uh, and that'll always be kind of neat to, to go back and listen to. Yeah, uh, that was uh, – a matter of fact, I think I was texting with you the week that you were calling one of those Brady games, and that 600 touchdown somewhere in there, I remember watching it or listening to it. Yeah. And, uh, and that was – man, that was cool. So Yeah, it was a lot of, a lot of fun. Mike uh, JC is uh, was with us earlier, and his he's having a tough time with technology, so he's trying to. Well, get it so all am I. Out. Really, I'm having a tough time with power. Um, you'll have to forgive the bad lighting and everything else I've got going on here. This is not my house. <laughs> this is a friend of mine who lives a couple of miles away um, in Atlanta. We have been hit by these. It's not like a deluge. It it's like these flash thunderstorms that come in, mm -hmm. cause incredible havoc for like twenty minutes, and then get out of your neighborhood. But in those twenty minutes, it managed to knock down several trees and power lines. So from yesterday afternoon on, I have been without power. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, the, these, I was watching them. I was. Before I came here, I was up late last night and watching these men and women go to work and, and so much respect for them trying to, uh, it's, I mean, it's a very dangerous job because some of these wires split and they're just laying on the ground. Um, and obviously you could get electrocuted. So they had to tape off the whole, you can't even drive on half my street. Uh, yeah, it's, it's insane. So while JC's having problems of a, of a different color, um, I am going through what a number of people, both in Atlanta and I guess up and down the East Coast, this has not been uncommon. I saw somewhere where it's like a record day of some type of weather phenomenon. It seems like yeah. every day we say something like that. But uh, yeah, it was uh, pretty pretty spooky, and we're just kind of cleaning up the the damage here. So it's one thing to be without like um, you know cable or internet, and you just kind of make do. But when you're without no power in the summer, it gets a little hot in Atlanta, just a little yeah. bit. Um, so yeah. air conditioning, there's no fans. Like you just, the air just sticks. And so that's what we've been uh, going through here. Well, I'm sorry, man. Hopefully it uh, makes its way back here pretty soon because it blew through here last night as well. It didn't actually end up being as bad in my neck of the woods as they were saying that it could be. But I know uh, the upper or the Midlands to the upstate of South Carolina. And then kind of like you said, that Atlanta area all the way up to kind of the DC and then into Delaware and the Northeast. There was, there's some people today who are, it's been rough. Uh, yeah. so certainly hope everybody is, um, is, is recovering from that. And, and, you know, Mike, if, I guess if it stays that long, um, you can just go down and stay at uh, at Saban's place. Nick Saban just bought a home down on Jupiter Island for seventeen and a half million dollars. Yeah, he's uh, now neighbors of Tiger Woods, Justin Thomas, and Ricky Fowler. So maybe maybe yeah. Nick's looking on the senior tour or something like that. I'm, I'm <laughs> sure. I'm I'm quite sure when when Nick is when he wins that last national championship. That's where his days and nights Which, are going to be. They won't be well, in Tuscaloosa. It's going to buy. By the way, that's going to be this year. In case anybody was wondering, since everybody's questioning Alabama, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, it's August the eighth. I'll go ahead and write that down, Phil. Um, oh, yeah, because you know, immortalize it on the internet. Well, you know, look, <laughs> hey, he, he he's he's tired of hearing it. I mean, they're they're all second guessing him. They've got him ranked all the way down at third. 
in the preseason coaches poll uh, behind Georgia and Michigan. And we know what would happen if those guys had to play Michigan. Michigan wouldn't even have a football team anymore. I mean, be, they de- they destroy the whole thing. So, you know, people thinking LSU is going to win that that division for the second year in a row. Say, we ain't going to have any of that. He's just going to go win the national championship, Mike. I think he's got one more in him. And I think that's what he's that's what he wants. Um, I've heard the argument, you know, some people worry about the Paul Bear Bryant syndrome where these guys, when they're not coaching and they finally give it up, they they die quickly because they can't fill the void. Um, I don't I don't necessarily buy that. I think Nick, unlike some of those other guys, uh, is in really good health and he's still got a lot of years to enjoy his retirement. And so I don't think he'll have uh, problems walking away at the right time. I don't think he'll have problems with his afterlife. I think uh, he and and Miss Terry will enjoy a very fruitful life in retirement. Is he is he not going to join College Game Day? Because he'd be pretty good. You know, I don't know if he. People have to understand. There's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, That is. You have to fly in a couple of days early. You have meetings. You have to go over things. Um, you know, Lee Corso's role obviously has been diminished a bit, but but Nick would not get that same type of treatment. You you hire Nick Saban on game day uh, to really go to work and and to be and and most of those guys have so much pride and they're kind of uh, workaholics by nature that they would want to put in the time. Every now and then, you got a former athlete that says, "I'll do TV and and does no work at all." Uh, but I don't see Nick being that guy. And I, I think you could see him like as a, an occasional guest panelist, but I don't know if I see him going like every day. I just don't know if that's, I don't know if he needs it quite honestly. Well, no, he doesn't need it. We all know no, that. I, I'm not, saying- not even just financially, Jamie. I, when I say he doesn't need it, 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 it's what I was talking about earlier to fill that void. Like fulfill the, yeah, yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm with you. I agree with you, though. Yeah. I don't think he needs that, though. He's. I don't think so. I, I, I think he, I think he's a guy that re- retirement will fit him just fine, and he'll play golf, and he'll vacation, and they'll do the things that you can't do uh, on a regular basis. Now you can do it in the off season, then they squeeze yeah. some of that in. But um, I, my guess is he he stays away from a whole lot of TV. Well, For his I, departure, I, Mike, do you foresee just an abrupt? All right, I'm out. I'm out. Not as abrupt don't, as don't Spurrier. Your hand. Well, yeah, I mean, not not necessarily. <laughs> but I would say at the end of a at the end of the no, season. But you know, I don't. Yeah. Th- do you think? I doubt Nick would make the same mistake as Spurrier is kind of you know intimate that oh, I got a few more years left in me. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll just come <laughs> yeah, out. And no, it. I, yeah. I I really think what all those guys dream about and what he'd love to do is truly finish that national championship, get asked the question, be coy, and then like. Two days later, you see on the scroll, uh, not not Brian Spencer Palmetto Medicare on the scroll, which is a great scroll. Uh, but Nick Saban retires after so many years, and you know eight national championships, and da da da. That's how I that's how I envision it. It's not like Nick is sharing this with me, but um, that's just that's just my projection. I would agree with that, and I would, I, I think he's. I'm telling you, they're going to win the national championship because he's angling right towards that. He's bought this house down here on Jupiter Island next to Tiger, and and he's got it all figured out here. In five months, after they win win another one, he's going to say, "Hey, I let everybody know I'm going to Jupiter Island, Florida, and uh, Godspeed and Roll Tide, and we're out." Um, Saving out wrong with that. And hey, and look, nobody be- when he took that job. Um, first off, they wanted Spurrier. Spurrier turned it down. Um, Told him to call Nick. Yeah. And there were, you had, uh, you had people calling up the fine bomb show at that time, which was just a radio show at that time saying, Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm hearing from Bill Oliver. He's, he's taking it. Spurrier's taking it. Um, (laughs) and you know, he, he came to Alabama and obviously people were excited, but nobody thought he would stay there that long. I don't think anybody thought Nick Saban would still be at Alabama because well, he took over in 07. So here we are 16 years later. I don't think anybody saw that. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, again, he's he's young for his age. He's been – he hasn't lost uh, anything on his fastball. 
and he loves coaching Alabama. Now, again, when he retires, he's not going to be one of these guys who's, I want my office still at Brian Denny Stadium, and, you know, I'm just going to hang out and go to practice. He ain't going to do any of that. He's going to be gone. He's going to be. I remember when, when Dave yeah. Odom was coaching at South Carolina, and a lot of people really liked Dave, but they also saw the program was – was going down and, and a common thing that would be said was uh well I could see Dave being like an ambassador to the school and and you know he could he could help out in fundraising and he'd be great to have him around and, and I knew I knew Dave fairly well and I'm like he ain't gonna stay in Columbia he's out of here like he, <laughs> the only thing he likes about Columbia is that he's employed here but he's going back to his beach place in North Carolina and where he played his college ball, where he coached Wake Forest, where his best years were. And I think he met his wife there. I mean, that's that was always – he was never staying around. Uh, now, the, the Pat Dyes of the world, he wanted to stay at all right around Auburn, and he wanted to stay in that building. And he was not afraid to be meddlesome with Terry Bowden, uh, and it was an issue. But uh, I don't see Nick Saban wanting to do any of that. I see him in Jupiter – and, uh, you know, cell phone off. <laughs> no, <laughs> He's going to be off the grid. And Alabama fans, cherish Draw the memories because you're not going to see a bunch of them when he's retired. All right. We're, we won't stay on this uh, much longer. I'm just going to ask. You got you to gotta answer it quickly. You can't, you can't JC this and just kind of <laughs> finagle your way through. All right. Whenever that, after he wins the national championship in January, who, who will replace him? Well, you're acting like that's an easy question to answer, and I could just <laughs> pull it off the top of my head in five seconds. Well, that's the point of the question. You know? Yeah. Well, I, let me tell you what I think it's going to be. I don't think it's going to be Lane Kiffin. I don't think oh. it's going to be you know, some of the names that will be rumored that I've seen rumored. Uh, I don't think it's going to be Dabo Sweeney. I don't. No, I don't either. No, I'm uh, not either. No. I, 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 I don't see that. So I, I think it's going to be somebody we're not talking about right now that at that time uh, would, would um, um, will emerge as the top guy. And it could be a guy with a pro background or it could be an up-and-coming young coach. But remember now, you can't possibly go Nick Saban and not, be, and not fall short of the goal. I don't care who it is. Right. They are going to fall short of what Nick Saban has accomplished. So to follow him, I don't want to say it's a death sentence, you're going to make a lot of money up front, but I don't know how long you're going to last. And I think most coaches that are in a really good situation now are not going to bolt for that job. 100% agree with you. I, I It has to be Alabama when this time comes, and it will be coming in January when they win the national championship again. I'm going to keep saying that now that I've said it. Um, They have to hire somebody who can handle that job because – and even if they hire somebody that handles that job, the chances of him getting fired within four to five years is pretty high. It, nobody ever replaces the guy and is better than the guy. That's never happened. I don't think that's or ever matches him. No, or even matches him, Jamie. I mean, when's the last time a guy followed a legend? You know, I go back to Bill Guthridge following Dean Smith uh, at North Carolina basketball in football. There's a bunch of examples now of course o'brien following joe paw that had asterisks written all over it um but look who followed barry switzer at oklahoma what a mess that was yeah. um look at look at the subsequent quote co coaches before urban meyer but after steve spurrier at, at florida state um you know it, nebraska since osborne Southern Cal since Pete Carroll. I mean, we, we could go on and on and on down that list, and very few even came close to their predecessor. I agree. I, I, I'm still – I do disagree with you here. I, I really think that there would be a strong possibility that it's Lane because he can yeah. handle it. He can handle it. Oh, he it. can handle – there's no – Lane can handle anything because Lane yeah. is – Lane, Lane's whole life and his whole persona is, hey, hey dog, I'm playing with house money. Yeah, it's um, all good. <laughs> like he just um, <laughs> now up, I man? do I do know from my times doing games in Tuscaloosa and and talking with people that were around there when Lane was there, Lane will have to. And I know he's changed his lifestyle for the most part, but when he was in Tuscaloosa, it was not a good scene. 
Right. Um, and, and that a lot of people know that very well. And I don't know if he wants to go back and have to, you know, visit that again. He he's on cruise control at Ole Miss. Here's a deal with Ole Miss fans, much like Mississippi State fans. They know who they are. Mm. They know who they are and they know what's realistic. And they're not, you know, out there leading the charge to fire every coach when they don't win nine, ten games. That's that's not the way it works in Oxford. They know who they are. And Lane knows that. That's why I never thought he was going to leave. It's just a, it's a perfect fit there because they they give Lane a, his, his space. They give him some leeway on things he's going to say and things he's going to do. Uh, but they also wins that are going to surpass most Ole Miss coaches, and they know that Ole Miss is not going to win an SEC championship anytime soon. They're realistic, and, and so that why would you want to give all that up to go to Alabama and follow Nick Saban? The money, you say the money, Ole Miss can pay really well. I, I'm not saying Alabama can't pay a little bit more, but it's it's going to be in the ballpark, Yeah, you know? So I get it, like, but Mike, if you take the Alabama job, you can do something you can't do at Ole Miss, which is win a natty, and that's true. That's true. I just don't know if it's, it's worth all that. So much about in, in today's climate of NIL, that a lot of coaches are like, screw this. I'm done. I've made my money. I don't need to put up with this. I, I'm all about coaching ball. I'm not about, uh, can, can we get 500 grand to this five-star recruit? Um, and, and so, Blaine, speak about this. He's yep. been as outspoken as anybody. Do you think he wants to deal with all that at Alabama, even though you're going to get your pick of the litter and the money's there, but so are all the headaches. I. I don't know. I, I'm not saying you're wrong. It's a very educated guess. I'm just saying I, I'd put my money on somebody else. Yeah, I no, I, I have no idea. I just the, the the all I'm saying is the type of human being that it would take. On top of the fact that when when you're the head coach at Alabama, like Coach Beamer, if he would have been hired at Alabama as a first time head coach, he'd have never survived. It's a different animal. Mm -hmm. It's a different animal and how you have you what you have to understand that you have to do every single day. Saban's got that down pat and he's in charge. Uh, this is not a job for first time head coaches. It's not a job for coaches who are early in their career. You know, it's it's a job for somebody who understands that Alabama is lit almost bigger than college football. Like it's it's one of the best. If you want to call it that. Oh, well, let's see that. It's one of the most demanding jobs in sports, being the head football coach at the University of Alabama. And, no um, you know, it, but my point was that Lane has the – so maybe there's another guy out there like Lane. But you know what? It doesn't matter because Nick's still the head coach, so who really cares? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So You've got it wouldn't surprise me if the next guy's already on staff, though. Like one of those just, you know, he's been some no-name guy flying under the radar, been with Nick for, say, five, six years. I don't know the makeup of all, you know, the thousand well, they just, analysts and they GAs just he's got. Yeah, yeah they and just then changed just changed both coordinators. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it'd be one of the coordinators, though, because that's a, you know, that's rehab for failed coaching. <laughs> well, <laughs> it'll I mean, be it, somebody below that level, I think. Yeah. Somebody that they're just going to say, hey, this is an Alabama guy. He's been with Nick for years, and this is our new guy. Could be. I mean, you just it, it's hard to know. Um yeah. because a lot of people are gonna expect a quote unquote big name home run hire type uh to replace Nick mm. Saban. Is that guy going to be on their staff? I mean, they they have had it's it's the reclamation project analyst role for so many coaches. Uh and I don't even know who's there now as an analyst. I'm sure if I take a look, there's some impressive names there always are. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Nick really. Saban, Nick Saban School of Rehab. It I mean, is. He brings everybody. It is. In. <laughs> and, and again, they can afford to do that. They can afford to do it, and and Nick is going to be able to command people that do it for like fifty grand because they know as a long term investment in their career, it's worth it. Right. So yeah, that's, that's that's been the secret form. That's been the secret formula since they. They allowed that rule, analysts. So you can't recruit, and uh, you're you're technically not 
you know, you're not on the sideline or I think you can't be on the sideline, right? If you're an analyst. No. Um, well, no, yeah, no, that's, yes, you can. You just can't have a can? headset on. You can't have a headset. Oh, you can't have a headset. Okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but I mean, throughout the whole week, analysts can do anything to be an extra coach. Hmm. I, I mean, there's, there's, they can help with play calling. They can help with breaking down film. They can help with strategy. So to be able to hire the people that he's hired and not even count against your 10 coaching, 10 coaches staff, it's a huge advantage. And how many programs can do that? Well, n none. I mean, yeah, one, right, yeah. one or two <laughs> others, maybe. I'm sitting here yeah. trying to. I, I well, we do know. Gary do Patterson's know. doing it, right? At at Texas. Yes, he's at Texas. Mm -hmm. um, Isn't that his role? Isn't he an analyst? Analyst, yeah. I always find it funny, by the way. Uh, right now, the Georgia and Alabama coaching staff is just littered with former South Carolina assistants under Will Muschamp. It's nuts. I mean, well, and it's it's, a, it's amazing how much smarter they look when they have. Five star after five star after yep. five star. Yep. It's the infamous right, Shane right, Beamer yeah. press conference from two years ago. There's yeah. five in Alabama. Yeah, Coleman exactly. Hutzler, Joe Cox, Robert Gillespie, Traveris Robinson, and Eric Wolford. Eric Wolford. Wow, you there you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's just crazy. All right, Mike, we got to step aside. Speaking of the dogs, we've got a question for you on them. Plus the coaches did release their top 25 poll yesterday. There is a North Carolina. There is no South Carolina. Other uh, thoughts and observations uh, from that release and much more. So everybody hang tight. We are painted garnet and black by a couple of painters. If you live in the Peach State or the Palmetto State, that would be Georgia and South Carolina for you Auburn fans. You can call a couple of painters, let me paint something.com and they will come paint anything on your property, including your animals. If you are in within those borders from the mountains to the seas, let me paint something.com. The still family is absolutely wonderful. They are fantastic and they are incredibly affordable compared to literally every other painter I've ever called. It's amazing. They're going to do some work for me coming up here pretty soon. Hang tight inside the Gamecocks, the show, the power hour presented by Palmetto Medicare. We'll be right back. Welcome home. That's what the Gamecocks say. And so does the Barn Doe Company, where they can build your dream home starting as low as $160 per square foot. If you live in the Carolinas, Georgia, or Tennessee, their turnkey process takes just four to six months on average and can be custom designed by size and details. Make your dream a reality. Visit thebarndominiumco.com. That's thebarndominiumco.com. The Barn Doe Company. Gamecock owned and operated. Welcome to TravelingCountryClub.com, your modern golf club experience. Hey folks, this is Michael Manis, former Gamecock golfer, inviting you to play more golf with a membership to TravelingCountryClub.com. With over 40 courses across the Carolinas, our membership provides you with an affordable way to enjoy a club-like golf experience. From the mountains to the coast, we offer golf courses that will challenge all types of golfers, no matter your handicap level or level of play. Plus, we offer unique membership benefits not seen anywhere else as part of Traveling Country Club. Tee it up with Traveling Country Club, TravelingCountryClub.com, TravelingCountryClub.com, proud partners of Inside the Gamecocks, the show. Hey everybody, this is Mo Copper from Carolina Football. The show is painted garden and black every day by a couple of painters. Go to LetMePaintSomething.com to check them out. Go Cox. 10% off for military repeat customers or mention the show. Interior, exterior painting, fencing, cabinet staining, concrete painting, popcorn ceiling removal, and more. 803-522-6832. LetMePaintSomething.com. <laughs>
freedom, Mike. Look at that. I'm in favor in this. Of it. Yeah, me too. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of freedom. <laughs> Some people apparently aren't, but we are around here. Uh, Ken, Ken Wisenhunt, by the way, is the special assistant to the head coach at Alabama. Did you know that? I didn't know that. No. No, but you could throw a million names at me, and I wouldn't be too surprised because, I mean, Nick can get all kinds of – that's the thing, too. Nick is a crossover appeal guy. Nick Nick is very well respected in the NFL. Oh, here's another one for you. Charlie Strong, analyst, Alabama. I had no idea. That I, that I knew. That I knew. Charlie just bounces – I mean, Charlie – if you went back and looked, he's had to have been since his days at, at Carolina. He's probably been over a dozen spots. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. And, he work out of Texas, and then it's just uh, uh, you know Louisville to Texas. Year after year after year after, year, he just surfaces. But he's always got work. He's yeah. always got work. Well, he should. He's a, he's a, he is brilliant. Yeah, of when course. It comes yeah, to defense. Oh, I mean, it's it's absolutely. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a, and I didn't realize that I guess uh ha ha Clinton Dix decided to give up the NFL dream and he's already on staff at Alabama too. Derek yeah. Dooley is on staff at Alabama. I mean, and, and that's that's another one that's kind of funny because right, because wow, he takes guys so Derek Dooley was a disaster at Tennessee, but that doesn't mean Derek Dooley can't coach. Right. I mean, it's almost like in the Will Muschamp vein. For whatever reason, Will Muschamp had two cracks at it, it didn't work. It had some high. It, look, it wasn't a complete disaster at Carolina. Like there, there were some good moments, particularly the first couple of years. The win in Athens between the hedges. He had a, a good year at Florida, but for whatever reason, he's just not cut out for that type of job. But he's good at what he does outside of that. And and from what I hear, people like working with him. And so I'm not surprised that he's had success in Athens. Um, there's a lot of guys like that. Like they took their shot. It didn't work out as a head coach, but they still bring value to the table in that in that room every week, and so they'll always have a job. That's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah, there's uh, I I can't Zach Mettenberger's on stage. Anyway, I could do this all day. All right, Mike. Uh, Georgia is uh, preseason number one according to the coaches. We will find out whom the media believes is. Uh, preseason number one coming up i think it's mon this co- upcoming monday whatever day that would be the 7th 13th somewhere in there um but georgia coming in right now at number one one of the th- today there has been some news that has broken out of athens and that is that the dogs have fired the staffer who survived the crash uh back in january that unfortunately took the lives of um multiple from that from that program about a month ago, uh, she filed a lawsuit. Or this staffer did. Victoria Bowles is her name um, against the university's athletic association. According to the AP, her dismissal was because she has refused to cooperate with an internal investigation into the crash. However, her attorneys claim that she's being retaliated against for filing the lawsuit that I just mentioned a, a moment ago. Details don't really matter, but here's what does. It has been seven months of questions about a lot of stuff that had nothing to do with football, Mike. Do you envision any scenario where that could affect the 2023 squad, who right now is widely regarded as not only the best team in the country, but expected to probably win another national championship before we kick off here? No, I don't. Uh, I think it's tragic what happened, and I think it's – there was there was bound to be some aftermath, you know. When when you're talking about people dying, that's where the story reaches another level, and you can't just just kind of sidestep it and move on. Um, but once the ball is no, I don't I don't think it's going to affect Georgia one way or another. I don't think it's going to affect Kirby one way or another. You had that guy that wrote that scathing article who was not even a sports writer. They were, they were laden with with yeah fact errors. Got fired, um, and I think your average Georgia fan is as high on everything about Georgia football as they've ever been. And you and you know that would be the same with any other fan base. If you're being honest, right? Yeah. I mean, yep. you're you're favored to win your third consecutive national title. Um, do you think 
you think there'd be a fan base of an SEC school that would just turn its back on whatever because of some of these issues? The answer is no. So no, I, I don't think it's going to be. Um, I don't think it's going to factor into much at all once the season starts. To be honest with you. Yeah, I don't either. I, and I think Kirby and that staff are, are that's a group of guys that are able to kind of keep things together. They've been through all the all the stuff over the years. Um, they are number one. They are one of six SEC teams that is ranked in the preseason top 25 coaches poll, Mike. The, that is the most of any league in the country. Uh, the second most is actually the Big 12 and the Pac-12, although that's going to change pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, you want to next- hear the you want to hear the power number here? And since it's the power hour, here's the power number on that poll. Uh-huh. If 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 you were to to frame it as of the 15 teams and what conferences they're going to be in as as soon as next year. Uh, 11 of the 15 are from the new Big Ten and the new SEC. 11 of the 15. Wow. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Go through that list, and there's only four schools in the top 15 that will not be in either the SEC or the Big Ten. Well, and two of them are out of the ACC. We're gonna get, we're gonna let you get into this here in just a little bit. I threw something out at the top of the show. I'd like you to chew on as well uh, when it comes to the conference realignment stuff that somehow has just crept its way into the kickoff. Of this. this is supposed to be happening in June, not August, but we're doing it now. Um, Mike, outside of the top, let's call it the top ten because they've got the Vols in there at number ten. We know that Bama, Georgia, and um, and LSU are three of the top five. When you look at the rest of the poll, and I'm not really too concerned about preseason polls. That's not necessarily what I'm getting at here. But as it strictly relates to the SEC, I'm talking about the league in general. With six teams ranked, that sounds wonderful. It's what's right outside of the top 25, including A&M at 25 and Ole Miss at 22. Yeah, Carolina technically, based on votes, at 27. The Gators right behind them at 28, and then Kentucky, Arkansas, Auburn, Mississippi State, Missouri, they've all received double-digit vote totals, if you will. So what that tells me is going into the season, we're pretty sure we know who the top three programs are. We're pretty sure we going in, we probably know who the top four programs are. And after that, who freaking knows? It could be a wild ride. In the southeast, yeah, that's right, that's right. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's much difference between the seventh best team in the country and the twenty seventh best team in the country. I really mm-hmm. don't. I, I, th- I think that the the top few. We are now at a point where there are there are, are a few programs that are such well oiled machines that nobody is really in their caliber. Georgia's one, Alabama's another. LSU, I think, under Brian Kelly, will go back to assuming that role on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Southern Cal could be that type of program. Ohio State, Michigan. I may be leaving one out, but I don't. I can't think of one. I mean, th- those. Th- there's just they're at a different level. Doesn't mean they're all going to go undefeated. We know they're not. Of course, some will beat each other, but but they're everything about those programs and where they are. And what they're going to continue to be, barring some major setback, um, they're at a different level. But then, but then when you're when you start looking at those teams like in the teens, none of them are great. They're all flawed. They could all right. lose to unranked team. You know, again, what's the difference between the 17th best team and the 37th best team? I don't think it's a lot. So you're you're when you it's almost like at that point, it's almost like a basketball game where the team that shoots better wins uh, because there's not a discernible difference in talent top to bottom. So it's just a matter of who plays better that day. But when, as, as opposed to when you play like a Georgia, it's not about who plays the better game. They can play an off game and still beat you by 30 because they're just so much more talented than you are in virtually every position. If South Carolina beats North Carolina, my gut tells me the Gamecocks are probably going to be in at the tail end of the top 25 next week with the AP. Um, mm-hmm. And um, But if they beat North Carolina week one, regardless of whether they are or aren't, they will be after that one. Anything that stood out in the coaches' poll, Mike, we all know that the coaches don't actually vote on this poll. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, anything that stood out, anything, ah, it's a little too high for me 
or something that's a little too I, low that might be indicative of how the year goes? I honestly didn't spend a lot of time even looking at it. I glanced at the top, the top fifteen. Yeah, and then I, I mean, I guess I could say I glanced at the whole thing, but but I really focused on like the top fifteen, and, and I met, like I mentioned that eleven out of fifteen stat stood out. Uh, in my mind, nobody takes these things seriously anymore. Don't matter. They're completely irrelevant. Um, the actual college playoff poll will come out in its normal time slot. So thankfully, we don't have to sit here and, and get upset about being ranked 12th versus 17th or 5th sure. versus 9th. And it, it doesn't it just doesn't matter. And I'm not sure if the AP poll matters much but either, you know, and they they supposedly take it seriously, but I know I know what goes into that line of thinking. Where were they last year? Yep. Uh, how many returning starters do they have? And what's the quarterback situation? And what's the schedule? That's it. I mean, it's not a magical formula. A lab uh, with beakers and different, you know, testing different theories and quantum physics. I mean, it's it's just simple that we all use when we're breaking down how good a team we th- think is going to be. And, and, uh, and so from that standpoint, you can normally predict what they're going to predict. It's a lot of, it's not a whole lot of like, whoa, that's out there. That's always bad. Like the, the knuckleheads that vote Vanderbilt first in the Eastern division. And I'm sure a couple of guys had a great laugh over that, but they're drowned out by all the other voters that are taking it seriously and going with the same formulas that everybody else is. Yeah. I think one of the easier bit ways when you talk about the, um, the final rankings and things like that. One of the better things to do is actually go back in previous years and look at the preseason top 25 polls and then go count how many of those teams actually are not in there at the end of the season, yeah. um, which is something that we'll do a little bit later on this week uh, with uh, the uh, the 22 poll last year because there's a large number of teams that didn't quite make it at the uh, very the end. Only, the only way a national champion comes out of nowhere, like unranked, I think the last might have been Auburn to do that mm-hmm. is if you've got something like a cam newton that nobody saw coming right i mean yeah. he was he was playing for the blinn buccaneers in the junior college ranks of texas when auburn got him i realized he was at florida before that but he did virtually nothing there all we knew about him is that he like stole laptops and and that he dominated juco ball but we didn't we couldn't have possibly foreseen what Cam Newton, the, the force he was going to be in that one year yep. at Auburn. So they went from, it, if, if it was not unranked, it was at the bottom of the top 25 to winning the national championship. But for the most part, if you look at that top 10, you're going to find your national champion top 10. The highest ranked team in 2022 that didn't finish in the top 25, none other than old the fighting Jimbos. They were number seven in the preseason. Yeah, that's easy to uh, yeah. forget. <laughs> And they were top ten preseason. Yeah, yeah. top, and that was so much. That was based on just recruiting hype. Yeah, they're preseason top twenty-five according to the coaches, and according to uh, uh, what's what's his name, Uh, Harley Neck Brace Boy, Um, uh, the you know their new offensive coordinator, Petrino. Bobby Petrino. I always just call him Harley, but Harley. It, nonetheless, <laughs> um, according to him, he works for Jim. That's what Klyovkov what... should be wearing right now at the Pac-12. Just come out with a freaking neck brace and, and kind of just look. <laughs> a bobblehead. bobblehead. We, we just, right. just combobulate and be like, I don't know what happened. Uh, I, had, I had a 12-team league, and what do I have now? Last the week, yeah, literally. Just ran me over. <laughs> yeah. If he could reverse, reverse course one week, what things – uh, how much things change. All right, we're going to hit a quick timeout. On that note, Mike, when we return, we'll, we will get into that and and finish our programming on it. And what in the world is the ACC thinking with Cal and Stanford? We'll let Mike Morgan give his thoughts. All right, here on Inside the Game, Cox, the show teed up by the coolest club in the Carolinas, TravelingCountryClub.com. It's Power Hour, brought to you by Palmetto Medicare. Golfers and wannabe golfers, former Gamecock golfer Meredith Taylor is now a full-time golf instructor in the Midlands of South Carolina. In-person golf lessons are held at the Country Club of Lexington. Half hour, hour, on course nine or 18 holes. And if you're outside of South Carolina, Meredith conducts virtual lessons. Just send in your golf swing for analysis. Gift cards are available for in-person one-hour lessons. Connect on Twitter at Mayor Taylor and find her online at McKellarEnterprises.org. Her email is on the website. Schedule your next lesson today with Meredith Taylor, former Gamecock golfer. (laughs) 
Electric Bikes of Charleston offers the most fun you'll ever have on two wheels. <laughs> Magnum, Velotra, Convention Bikes, and more. And they sell to consumers all across the state and offer outstanding warranties and service after the sale. Five levels of pedal assist plus a throttle help you handle the southern heat better but still get great exercise. Bikes are available all ages and sizes. ElectricBikesCharleston.com or stop into their store in Mount Pleasant. Electric Bikes of Charleston, powering inside the Gamecocks, the show. Electric Bikes of Charleston! 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 Twelve forty-five. Welcome back inside the Gamecocks, the show built by the Barndo Co. and always live from the Sinorama Studios. Mike Morgan, part of Power Hour here on Inside the Gamecocks. He's you hear him everywhere, but he's also, of course, part of JC and Morgan, which is part of the All New Chief Sports Network, which is available on the All New Chief Sports app, which you all should download, just like Mike has done. Hey, Mike. Absolutely. <laughs> I've downloaded it. I've told friends, family, important people to download it. I would tell Brian Spencer to download it, but he's probably going to need some help to do that. Uh, as we've talked about, you know, he is not the tool in the shed. Uh, he's not a guy that uh, is going to win a beauty contest. You see the picture on the screen. For those of you that just are listening on audio, just take my word for it. This is this is not a guy. This is this is not George Clooney we're talking about here. Uh, but what he is is your answer to taking care of all your Medicare needs, if somebody in your family are getting near that age or maybe you've already hit 65, what have you, and you, you, you want to make sure you're heading in the right direction, you need to get the best possible plan. It's not something you want to do on your own. Brian's been doing this since 2005. Palmetto Medicare has been around since then. And again, I've known it for 20 years, all kidding, but I, I trust this guy with this uh, particular endeavor as much as anybody out there. And he's done so much good work for so many people for a long time. Uh, you see the phone number. And I know, again, a lot of people are just listening. So I'll mention it for you because it's one you'll want to remember. 803-960-9484, 803-960-9484. And check out the website, too, palmetto-medicare.com. You can get more information there, palmetto-medicare, palmetto-medicare.com. And uh, chat with Brian. Let him let him devise a plan that's best for you, your family, your loved ones. It'll be a load off your mind. And as always, tell him we sent you here from inside the Gamecocks. Yeah, can't thank him enough for, first of all, what he does for the people in the Palmetto State, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly what he does for us as well. And um, it's uh, right there every power hour, and you hear their spots here every day on Inside the Gamecocks, the show. As Mike pointed out, 803 960 nine four eight four mike real quick here i got a text from uh a uh, from jc during the break that uh Devontes walker or tez walker the uh, apparently going into the season they considered him potentially the top wide receiver for north carolina then stuff a has ruled him ineligible whoa uh, now uh they're going to appeal the the appeal this but it's a kid who started his career at north carolina central he actually transferred initially to Kent State and then decided to enter the portal and transfer to North Carolina. I'm assuming that's probably where this is coming from. But he has been declared ineligible by the NCAA. He's their best wide receiver. That's a big loss if it turns out to be the case. Uh, he, he is the guy they're most excited about in that receiver room. Um, so that would be – that would be – I don't want to say crippling, but remember, they lost already Joshua Fields to the NFL. He was their their Swiss Army knife who did everything. Um, and and they needed to go to the big guy right away. And he's that guy, big-bodied receiver, um, experienced. And if you say, well, come on, what was the level of competition? He he balled out against Oklahoma last year. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not like he just played MAC competition. Most of those MAC schools, in order to pay the bills, they've got to play power programs. And so – He's no stranger to that. 
it's a big deal for South Carolina. One of the strengths of their football team this year is expected to be the secondary. Tez Walker was going to challenge that in week one. Uh, as of now, he will not be able to do so. The NCAA has said, no, sir, uh, you cannot play in 2023. We'll see if the appeal is able to be pushed through. Mac Brown just said a moment ago that that is ongoing. So we'll keep our eyes on that in the uh, coming couple of weeks. Mike, the carousel is spinning here in early August across the country. Conference realignment. Uh, yesterday, Pete Thamel comes out with the story that the ACC is at least exploring uh, Cal and Stanford. <laughs> Phil and I and JC talked about this at the top of the program today that Somebody from the ACC chimed in with, uh, well, you know, there, there, there's there's a lot of travel expenses involved here, so we got to look at that. Yeah, you think? So that's that's um, not news to anybody. Mike, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. We know it has happened with the Big 12 and with the Big 10. It's a shame to me to see the Pac-12 fall apart. I I. I hate that, and I, I hate it more than football. Um, mm -hmm. The Pac-12 has been a wonderful league for a long time. Baseball, softball, the Olympic sports, it's had its moments in basketball, as we well know. And, by the way, the football league this year has got five in the preseason poll. It's it's a pretty good league. It's a great quarterback league this year. Great quarterback league. Absolutely. You know, and it's, and it's gone. With all of that said, uh, sticking a little bit closer to home, this conversation to kind of narrow it down, the, your your initial reaction to the news that the ACC would even consider Cal and Stanford, what do they add? And here's one for you. Why not Army-Navy for the ACC? Hmm. I, I don't take anything off the table right now. I mean, the ACC is going to have to be in creative mode and not just let's just stick with our the hand that we have mode. I wonder if this if the talks are real with Cal and Stanford, if at some point you're going to have to look at the football only model for those kind of deals, right? Because I don't think the ACC is going to add a bunch of schools from out west, and I don't think Cal and Stanford are are that all in that they they want to just live on the Atlantic coast for every sport. The thing about football travel, I you know I spent ten years traveling. Uh, all three sports, football, basketball, baseball, the easiest by far is football. So go, flying across the country to play a football game, like I hear this all other oh, Southern Cal, wait till you play Rutgers. They don't care. I mean, that's an easy charter flight. They're not, they're not going through security <laughs> lines like you and I are. They're, they're not, they're not wedged up in that middle seat. You know, they're not worried about they, we can't have peanuts because the guy in 15 E has a peanut allergy. Uh, they're flying charter. They're getting fed incredible meals. They have all kinds of space. They're being, being catered to, not by the angry flight attendant that had a bad day and hates her job and is going to take it out on you, but by the people that are so happy of a charter flight as opposed to the other nonsense. So football travel across the country is no big deal. Uh, and the fans that really want to go and tailgate and spend money, they're going to do it, and the ones that don't, the overwhelming majority that don't, will do what we all do and watch the games on TV. If it's football only for Stanford Cal, then I could see where that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for them. Now, what do they add to the ACC? Not a lot, to be honest with you. If we're just talking football, I mean, I don't know what's happened to Stanford. You know, The, the moment that they lost Law and McCaffrey – David Shaw apparently forgot how to coach winning football, and the program has just been in the downward spiral ever since. And Cal has just been a, pretty much irrelevant for a long time. So they're brand, they're, they're brand names, kind of, and see where maybe you just feel like it's time to, to add a little something, something. But no, it doesn't help. I don't think it, it helps the ACC a whole lot. I think it'd be a great life preserver. Uh, or a life raft for Stanford Cal football because they need to go somewhere. And I don't know if uh, if the American is an option or not. But um, honestly, if bet on all, I don't think that happens. I think it's just discussions, which the ACC should be having discussions, and they should be be open to new ideas because 
There's work to be done. You've clearly got programs that desperately hate the contract and want to get out. And even if it's on ironclad contract, it's like, I don't know, if you were in a toxic relationship, but for whatever reason, you weren't allowed to get divorced, but you still, you still slipped under the same roof every day. And, you know, you, you, you still technically were married because something in the contract says you have to be, you be a real healthy relationship. <laughs> you know, at some point <laughs> you're going to look at each other like, why the hell are we in the same house together? I hate you. You hate me. Let's, let's get a divorce. So uh, how it turns out, I just don't know. Okay, so I mentioned this, and anybody that is just tuning in now is going, what, what, why would you even say that? If you're the ACC, why fall in line? Okay, why not maybe get a little bit creative and do something that nobody would expect you to do? Why fall in line? Well, everybody's adding teams. We have to add teams. Okay, that's what it seems a little desperate right now. If this, of course, I'm with you. They have to explore all options. I understand that. But why not say, well, now, wait a second here. We could really create this new American feel about our league. The average sports fan out there will now tune in to the ACC if we just go knock on the door of Army and Navy. Now, what are they going to bring from a football standpoint? Probably not much, and I get that. Really, quite frankly, not a whole lot at all. But it eventually could help their programs with a little bit more money become a little bit better. They'd have to change their offenses and stuff like that in football. But why not? Well, don't you think that would create something that no, nobody else can have? They'd have the two premier institutions in America in their league. Yeah, I, 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 I get that, Jamie. I just think outside of the Army-Navy game, which is phenomenal, and it's, it's, it's a bucket list. It's one of the few games I have not been able to to see in person and want to so badly. Army versus Wake Forest, Navy versus Florida State, Clemson versus Army. I, I just don't know what that really does for the for a league that 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 almost that almost might come across as I don't want to say it because it sounds disparaging, but it almost might come across as a little bit desperate. Like we got to just add to add. And this mm -hmm. is and 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 nobody else is is coming here. Uh Geographical footprint. Now that's the part that makes sense. Sure. And and the prestige of Army Navy is is a different kind of prestige, but it doesn't add to the strength of your football league or any other sport. No, not until they beat until one of them beats one, right? Till Navy. Yeah, not until goes, the conference dollars start rolling till, in and those special Navy, prep, yeah. trip somebody up. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Navy shows up in Coral Gables and knocks off Miami. You know, oh, and look, that could happen. Well, that might could happen. That could happen. Believe <laughs> yeah. me, I, I've actually called a couple of Navy games uh, where they've beaten some some Power Five schools, and uh, especially when uh, Coach N had it going there, they were you know they were a, a nine ten win team a year. Navy was rocking and rolling. And then for whatever reason, it just went south. I I don't pretend to know why, but yeah, honestly, I I don't see that one. I, I could see a better chance of adding Stanford Cal, maybe football only, um, which I think some programs are going to seriously have to look at ball only. I mean, why? Because again, football charter is no big deal. But my other point is I've also traveled for sports like baseball mm -hmm. and that is a big deal. And so would women's volleyball and so would softball and so would track and it, it, that would be a nightmare. Nightmare. Financial nightmare, a logistical nightmare, a nightmare for the student athlete, a nightmare across the board. But if you wanted to just keep like some West Coast uh, schools together in a cluster to play all the other sports, then maybe I could I could see that. I don't know. I mean, there's no great solution here left. Like the best solutions that were on the board are off the board. They're off the board. Well. The easy solution for the Pac-12 is just to merge with the Mountain West. That's yeah. The, that's the Do easy they? solution. I said the, the word, yeah. that's an important word there. It's the easy. I'm not saying it's the right one, but it's the easy one. But if I'm the Mountain West, I've got a pretty healthy TV deal, and, and I'm on solid footing. Why do I want to get involved with these guys? But wouldn't that help them, Mike, those four programs? Well, it, 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 if everything was – if the Pac had its you-know-what together, yes, it would. Mm -hmm. But the pack doesn't, so they don't yeah. bring any. They they don't they don't bring to the table what they should, 
had you had a commissioner that did anything right in the last five, six, seven years, <laughs> then they they would be able to bring guaranteed dollars and to the to the to the league. I I don't know if that's the situation. Now. I don't know if that's the situation. I mean, it, it as crazy as it sounds, the Mountain West might be looking at what's left of the pack and going, "No, it's okay. We're all right. We're good. No, we're you good. guys, <laughs> you, you you do your thing." We'll roll with San Diego State and Boise State and Fresno State. Like we'll we'll be okay because as we've talked about before, there's never been a better time. Group five football, yes, the gap has widened, but they were there was always a wide gap. I mean, they never had illusions that they were going to be playing for national championships at those particular schools. But the group five now, the dollars are better than they've ever been. The TV exposure is better. I mean, how many times would San Diego State have been on national television 10 years ago? Well, now every game is. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and so it, it's not that bad a deal to be. If, if you know that you're never going to be where, like, if you're, if you're Stanford and you're facing the, the, the idea of having to go from the Conference of Champions for 100 years, now you're going to the group five, that's a bit of an ego blow. But if you've been a group five type of program your whole life, now is the best time to be in the group. It's never been a better setup for them. Plus the expanded playoff, plus all the bowl games. So more and more teams from those type of leagues get in the Sun Belt, the Mountain West. I mean, people know Coastal Carolina yep, because they've seen them on TV. They've seen them in bowl games. People know these. Pro they're no longer mysteries. They're no longer just kind of buried aside in the world this. So I don't know if the mountain West is in a hurry to take those four schools on right now. Well, you know, we could all be thinking a lot too much into this. The big 10 could have plans to say, well, you know, I tell you what, we'll go ahead and bring these other four guys in too. the big 12 might be thinking that the big 10 brought Rutgers in. And I know it was a different era and it's about TV markets and things like that. I right. All that, but I'm just saying, um, you know, if there's a way to work a money angle, that's all this is all about. The Big 12 might be looking at this saying, yeah, you know what, They're, they'll add something, and here's what it's, we'll do. It's 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 always possible. I just I, I don't know if they're going to get together and, again, look at that pie and the slice, how it's sliced up, 18 for the Big 10 and now 16 for the Big 12. When you add a school, that's one more slice of the pie. Is yeah. everybody still going to get the same thirty-two million guaranteed in the Big Twelve, and eventually in the Big Ten, and the end going to be close to a hundred? Um, are you still going to make that, or do you have to slice it with Oregon State and Washington State? No one's going to want to do that because their their brands are not that great, their geography is not that great, and so why am I going out of my way to sacrifice dollars for that just to add schools? Of the four programs that are left. In the Pac-12, I'm using Boise State as a comparable here. Do any of them? I would say Stanford does, maybe. But do any of those others have a bigger profile at this point in time than the Boise State Broncos? I'm talking about Oregon State, Washington State, and Cal. Uh, I mean, on recency bias, you could say Boise State is is right there, although they've faded a bit. Th th these are not the Boise State teams of 10 years ago, right? Well, and overall, though, now, like their basketball program has done a nice job for itself as well. Boise State? Mm hmm. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I mean, we all know basketball is a distant second in, in these decisions. And I, it's not like Boise State's, you know, making final four runs in <laughs> basketball. Not yet. I, I, I think they're running that, Rebels. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Wazoo flag is, you know, out there every game day. Hey, yes, that, is. That, that Mountain West <laughs> Conference, that Mountain West Basketball League is fun to watch, man. There's some good basketball in that. Yeah. League. See, I think San Diego State, mm -hmm. and they got a new football stadium, and they're in a Southern Cal market. I think San Diego State could be more attractive than Oregon State and Washington State, believe it or not. Well, I don't disagree with that at all. I, I think I almost think that's a given, to be honest with you, at this point in time where we are. I'm just trying to wrap mm -hmm. my head around if there are enough programs that could find a way to solidify themselves out there in one league uh, that would would you know be beneficial to anybody. Um, you know, if those four just jumped in and joined the Mountain West, wh wh where would they even be? If those four today were named 
the four new members of the Mountain West, mm -hmm. would they be instantly be the top four programs in the league? I don't know that they would. I don't know that. No. Any now, Oregon, of them would. Oregon State had a nice year last year, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but Washington State post Mike Leach, Cal's how, terrible. Cal, well, yeah, Cal's awful. Yeah, they're, they um, should be. They are. <laughs> Cal has just been, and, and again, St Stanford's the one that just boggled. I, I mean, I've been to Palo Alto. It, it, the, the reputation, the history from, from John Elway to Jim Plunkett, I, I can't imagine why Stanford has not been better. It's uh, it's sad to see if you're a, a West Coast football fan, how they have just hit the skids out there. Don't fall asleep on the American. Uh, Mike Oresco is one of those guys that that gets it. Yeah. And and Mike Oresco, I could see being aggressive and making a move to say, hey, look, if the Mountain West is, doesn't think you're good enough, we certainly do. And in the day and age where everybody's traveling everywhere anyway, why don't you come join our league? We're all over the place. You could be yeah. all over the place, too. <laughs> I was about to say, wait a second. You can be in your yeah. place, too. Yeah. The American... Yeah. The American literally is the American. The American conference. literally, it's like Conference USA used to be. It literally lived up to its name. It covered the whole USA, and that's what the American <laughs> might soon do. They might if they get those out west. Yeah, you're talking about you're talking about North Carolina, Florida, Texas, Oklahoma. They got the Pennsylvania. They got that gum program. Again, Louisiana for, program. for football. It doesn't matter. Like the extra the extra price of gas on that charter to go to a, another time zone it's 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 a rounding error it's the other sports that you really uh feel for and unfortunately they get lost in the shuffle in all these decisions but i mean we already have that now i mean even in the SP, you know you you've got uh, the the florida volleyball team traveling to como to take on missouri that's not right. an easy trip you take a commercial flight you fly into either kansas city or st louis then you get in your car and then you drive two hours or in their case a bus I mean, I've done it dozens of times. It's not it's not a picnic. For football, it's no breeze. For basketball, you just charter, kiss the ground in Como, get out, get on the bus, you're in the hotel in 15 minutes. That's the difference. Well, there's going to be, with all these new affiliations you're gonna have tennis teams and swimming and diving teams that they're gonna be this is this is nuts I, eli and, drink and, was right the other day by the way who's that eli drink was what he said the other day he wasn't wrong yeah no he wasn't he wasn't um eli eli's always outspoken he, he also knows it's a big year for him and uh <laughs> that's 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 been a, a tough situation there Wait, because he just got a new deal what does that mean? I don't think I that don't matters. Know. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Not with all this TV. What does that money? ultimately mean? mean? No. no. Yeah. Uh, in, in this day and age? No. Nah. No. Nah. Yeah. You pay players and pay coaches off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not that hard to always look for the buyout. Never look for the yep. years. Always look at the buyout. Got a tweet from a guy that you covered, Mike Tim Frisbee, who said, seriously, they can't refer to it as the Power Five any longer. What are we calling it? My suggestion is the Super Two and Friends. That's uh, about right. That's, that's about what right. Yeah, two, I mean, two Snow Whites and the Dwarfs. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, it's it's NFC, AFC has been you know that's the analogy it's been made a, a million times. But there's no question the hole that those two leagues will have on the power structure of college athletics as we know it, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. No, and they're going to. Big have Twelve to. did a terrific job to really maintain. A, a, that's a solid league. So it's a big is. fan of the SEC, but that's a really solid league that they did. Uh, I give kudos. And the ACC is desperately going to try to keep Florida State and Clemson. But if they don't, they're going to be in trouble too. Is that your Brian Spencer? In the chat that, box? I it could be. That's it, you know. <laughs> I don't want to. If it's another Brian Spencer, I don't want to insult him. What, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does, what does the Rose Bowl do now? Well, it's not the, the Rose Bowl anymore. No, and it wasn't. It's already been. Yeah, that's already changed with the playoff. Yeah, that's what's going to change. Though. They're going to have to relook at the playoff because they can't. I mean, I mean, well, they can keep it the six highest conference champions. That's true, but it won't be the Power Five. I mean, that's it wasn't guaranteed that way before, but that was pretty much the way that it was going to land. That's yeah. not going to be the case moving forward. You just mentioned it a moment ago at the group of five. So. 
Yeah, the, the Power Five designation doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah, it is. It is. Mike, he's, he, we're throwing blows here. This is, this is good stuff. We'll have to do uh, – <laughs> yeah. He is in better shape. Uh, Brian Spencer oh. is – Oh, now the compliments that. come. Uh, he, well, that's as far as I go. Uh, you know, he's, he's one of these – what you call it, Phil? A tire turner, a tire – one of those CrossFit guys. He's backing down. He's yeah. <laughs> Brian's put him in his place. That, that's uh, yeah. Well, I mean, look, I gotta give him credit where where it where it's due. 803-960-9484. Palmetto dash Medicare dot com. Brian Spencer. That's right. All right. Uh, thanks to the golden tones of the great Mike Morgan Power Hour, uh, brought to you by Palmetto Medicare. As you just mentioned, thanks to Hale McGranahan for joining us in hour number one. JC. Try it again tomorrow. He's on the road <laughs> traveling, so we'll see if we can get Hopefully that. Hopefully by then I'll have power, guys. So Yeah, yeah. power hour. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll you had more you, power uh, in this show than at your house. It's crazy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, hopefully I'll have power in my house for the uh, the Thursday edition. So I'll look forward sure. to seeing you guys. Yeah, look forward to that as well. Uh, for Mike, Phil, JC, and Hale, I'm JB. Inside the Gamecocks, the show built by the Barndo Co. from the Sinorama Studios. We'll see you tomorrow.